Well, good morning. It's a good day to be able to do what we're about to do, not in the sense that um, it's a particular uh, greater portion of a service, of a worship service, but rather it's a pivotal point in a family's life and even more so a pivotal point in the church family. Uh, today we have a couple coming to dedicate their son to the Lord and even more so their lives to be a reflection of the goodness of the gospel before him. So today we have Lydia and Ryan Kirkland and they're coming to bring Liam Thomas Daniel Kirkland. I had to memorize that. But, um, their life verse is, his life verse is Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Or one translation says, only goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. They have family, friends, loved ones uh, here today. Uh, it, would y'all please stand if you are here with their family or friends or loved ones as a sign of support. Yeah. You can be seated. Thank you. Church, it's no small thing that we've come to dedicate Liam to the Lord. And we'll see how this goes. More, more along the lines of his excitement with me. Liam, these are those who would seek to raise you in the ways of Jesus, who would seek that you would follow the Lord and his goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. So, Liam Thomas Daniel Kirkland, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his face to you and give you peace so that the whole world may know that Jesus is Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And the church says, Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand you back now. Yeah. We have Ashley Woodard who's going to come now and, and pray a prayer. I want to invite you just to extend your hand where you are towards this family, knowing that we're praying together as a church family for them. are willing to serve you and for the way they are willing to bring up Liam to love you, to know you, and to serve you. We pray that as a church, we'll be able to walk beside them, to give them strength when they need strength, comfort when they need comfort, that we will celebrate with them and that we will lift them up when things are hard. We thank you for Liam and we pray that he will grow to know you, to love you, to follow in your footsteps, and that he will be part of making your gospel known worldwide. We love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to surround this family. In Christ's name, amen.
We greet you in the strong name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for being here today. Hey, meet me in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. As you're turning there, hear my thanks um, to our mountaineers, to our sanctuary choir, and, and to our orchestra church. Would you give thanks to God for their hard work and service before us today? Yeah. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Would you listen carefully for this is God's word to us? Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called, the, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Help us, O oh Lord, for we ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was speaking with a college friend recently and we were catching up and reminiscing about college, our college experience and memories that we had and uh, the conversation even you know easily flowed from one thing to the next and then we began to talk about our spiritual uh, the spiritual aspect of our lives and um, I shared and then he shared and he he said this phrase maybe you have heard this phrase or heard this sentence before you know Nick I I'm really a New Testament guy I really just only want to read the, the New Testament. Maybe, maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you've said that before. And I get it. Listen, some of us might still be stuck in Leviticus on our daily, yearly Bible reading that we started in January. Uh, it's October now, or November now, even worse. And here we are. You know, still in Leviticus. I get it. Uh, maybe the coming to a text like the Sermon on the Mount, it just it just seems easier to read than the salient details of what to do with uh, various forms of an uh, various animals and various forms of cloth and things like that. I, but I wonder today. I'm just a New Testament guy. Is that what Jesus would actually say? And then in light of that, would that actually be the posture that we should have as, as Christians? I think it's interesting here that at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives this overview of the, of the Beatitudes, these, these blessed uh, sayings here. And then from that, then in light of that, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Maybe a, a summary overall view of what it means to live for Yahweh and his kingdom. And, but here he seems to pause for a moment. I don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I, I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. I, I wonder what Bible... Jesus read. Have you ever wondered that? Jesus didn't have the privilege that we, well, I, I guess used to have, to be able to walk into a Lifeway Christian bookstore and walk out with a Bible and some sort of beautiful saying we can put in form on our desk. Uh, students, a, a bookstore is a place where you walk in and you can buy a real book and walk out with it. They, they, 
They don't exist. We're going to call them museums here in a little bit, but that's, so here we are. He didn't have that privilege. I mean, he, he couldn't just simply walk in and get a study Bible that went from Genesis to Revelation. So what Bible did Jesus read? You ever asked yourself that question? Um, Jesus here says, don't think. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He says it twice. Um, not to abolish, not to put away, not to set aside, but to fulfill, to, to in a real sense embody. But what is Jesus embodying? Well, the law and the prophets, kind of his shorthand, I think, when it comes to being able to say that the Old Testament in, in total, the, the law that was given through Moses and the prophets, oftentimes we call them history, not just prophets, uh, but prophets, even some of the history books that we would call history are prophets as well. And so he's saying the whole Old Testament, I've, I've, I've not come to put this aside, but rather I've come to fill this. I've come to embody this. I've come to fulfill this. And that's important for us, I think, because if we're not careful, we could easily just simply slip into heresy and the implications therein when it comes to how we view God's Word. Uh, that we, maybe in a sense, would simply just become a New Testament guy. Uh, I think of in church history, there was a theologian who thought similarly to how my college friend thought of the Bible, and he uh, did not appreciate the Old Testament. Matter of fact, he would say that, uh, this theologian would say that the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament is a different God than the God of the New Testament, the Father of Jesus. Uh, it, this theologian's name was Marcion. And he lived from 80 A.D. to 160 A.D. Right after the time of Jesus, when you begin to think about this, and, and here this heresy crops up. And so what he did was he cut out the Old Testament and only subscribed to the New Testament. Almost in a sense that the God of the New Testament won over and beat the God of the Old Testament. And he did that through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that's heresy. And others, uh, in the other church fathers like uh, Irenaeus and Tertullian, can we just pause for a moment and say that people were called a lot cooler names back then than they are now, Marcion, Irenaeus, Tertullian. These two said, no, it, it, it is one God. It was, a, it was an argument for the Trinity. It was an argument for the total canon itself, the Bible itself. No, God is one, and His Word is true from Genesis all the way through the end. Um, but I wonder today what would be those guardrails that we would put here. I, I think an understanding of Jesus' fulfillment and he, what He would actually say of the Bible itself, and by the Bible I mean not simply the Bible, I mean not the Old Testament in particular, what He would say of that should inform the way that we view God, God's Word. It's the boundary with which we can live. God's given us a lot of different boundaries in that way. I, our little girl was in kindergarten last year, and uh, they sent out uh, a note for any parents that wanted to sign up on a field trip to be a soup chaperone on a field trip. And wanting to fulfill all the dreams of my kindergartner and getting rid of all the dad guilt that I ever might have in my life, I signed up for this field trip to be a chaperone. The, the place we went with all the kindergarten classes at Buff, Bluff Park Elementary, which seemed to be 172 different classes, which was 1,000 children, I think, was the bowling alley. So I'm sitting here the night before, and I'm thinking, I know how much our little girl weighs. And as a chaperone, I'm probably going to have responsibilities for other children. And I'm going to have to carry this ball all the way to the edge of the line. And she's going to try to roll this thing. She's not going to get enough oomph in it. And it's going to be that slow, slow, slow roll. It's going to get stuck in the middle. And I'm going to have to cross that line and run down there 
and try to grab them. And then a 16-year-old from the desk in the back is going to say, sir, please get back behind the line. Complete embarrassment. But all I'm thinking is there's going to be nothing but gutter balls. That's all that's happening. But thanks to your tax dollars and whatever they charged us for that field trip, we had those little bumpers put on the sides. And all of a sudden, these children who could barely lift a, a bowling ball, much less push it far enough down, had the strength of Hercules and Xena warrior princess all in one. And these boys and girls are slinging this thing down. and they're incredible. These guardrails that we have in that moment, I, I think of those when it comes to how we would understand God and His Word. That we can so easily get off into the gutter in different ways of simply saying, well, you know what, I, I like the New Testament better. Maybe I should just read that. Or I, I, I seem to understand simply what it means to love God and love my neighbor. Let me just stick with that, and I never need to engage anything in the Old Testament because didn't Jesus say that? But what's so interesting is as Jesus begins to frame the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, he himself uses this fulfillment of the law, his fulfillment of the law, and particularly his fulfillment of all righteousness, as the framework with which we are to view the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. This guardrail, these guardrails Jesus gives us here. He's not come to abolish it, to put it away, to make it useless, but rather he's come to fill it full, to fulfill it. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, the smallest letter, or the stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all these things are accomplished that maybe you've heard in the King James translation, <clears throat> not one jot or tittle. Uh, another translation, uh, not one iota or dot. Some of the smallest markings that you can make in the languages Jesus says that even to the smallest, seemingly insignificant dot, none of that will pass away, meaning none of that has insignificance, but rather I've come to fulfill it fully and completely until all things are accomplished. And so we must, must hear and, and hear well that what Jesus has come to do is not just simply kind of give us a new thing that we kind of do, but rather fulfill all things in him so that then we would be able to walk in the newness of life. I think about how Jesus would even understand the Bible in the sense of how he's teaching them God's word, how he himself is the fulfillment of what has been promised. I mean, think back to Genesis, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, things seem to go really well. And by Genesis 3, sin is in the camp and God is handing out judgment. But even in that judgment, we hear that proto-evangelion, that first gospel, that first word of hope that comes to Adam and Eve. Namely, that her offspring, the seed, will rise up and it will grow strong and it will crush the serpent's head. That is what is fulfilled, not simply uh, in the coming chapters, but ultimately in Jesus. I think about Genesis chapter 12, when Abram is there, and he uh, has not had any children through Sarah, and yet God says, I'm going to give you a child, an offspring, I'm going to give you land, uh, and you're going to be a blessing. You're going to bless all the nations, and they'll be blessed through you, particularly through this offspring that is yet to come. And we can see that as a fulfillment in Isaac, but Isaac doesn't simply point to himself, but he points past himself. And he doesn't simply point from Isaac to Jacob or Jacob to Joseph, but rather not even to David, but ultimately to Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of that promise that was to come. The Old Testament is, is absolutely essential. And Jesus has not come to push it to the side or, or make it insignificant, but rather to help us see that God is one. And from that then, Therefore, therefore, whoever breaks one of these, one of, one of the least of the, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does the, doesn't teaches these commands will be called great 
in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not trying to push to the side the significance of God's word, the law, the Old Testament, but rather he's trying to show the significance of it and he himself is going to embody it perfectly. Because what Jesus is ultimately getting at, I think in this sermon, is not just a simple cosmetic Christianity, but rather something that goes deeper and fuller. Not something that's simply dealing with the external. And maybe you would say a list of do's and don'ts. But rather something that can pierce not simply skin, not just bone, not just marrow, but even to our very soul. That's what Jesus has come to do. And that's how we then are to, I think, view this sermon that Jesus is ultimately saying it's something greater. It's, it's the heart work. Uh, because I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. Now we hear that word, uh, th those descriptions of people, scribes and Pharisees, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of bad press has been made of these people. Uh, but, but these people are actually... They're, they're good people. See. They, they would want to follow God's word. I mean, you might not want to invite them to your Halloween party or your trick-or-treat thing, but like, these are people you would actually want in your life. So to think that they're just some awful scum-of-the-earth type people is to completely misunderstand the, the culture. But rather, these people are, are, are taking Yahweh seriously. They want to follow him. But what they've missed, friend is that they think it's ultimately about the external, the do's and the don'ts, and seemingly have missed the, the internal. Because Jesus is ultimately getting at the heart in this. Now, where is Jesus getting that from? He's getting it from the Old Testament. I mean, think with me, jump back with me to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Look, the days are coming, this is the Lord's declaration, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand and led them out of the hand of Egypt. My covenant they broke, even though I am their master. The Lord's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. See, these passages we get are seemingly the seeds of the gospel. One theologian said the Old Testament is the, is the seed of the gospel, and the New Testament is the blooming of the gospel on display. That what Jesus is ultimately getting at is not simply the external, but it's something internal. Jesus is wanting to talk about ultimately a, a heart change, not just simply looking good on the outside. I think about uh, when I coached my little brother in rec basketball. I graduated high school and my best friend Chunk and I felt called by God to coach my 11-year-old brother in the 11 and 12-year-old rec basketball league. And it was a calling from God, let me tell you. That year, for whatever reason, we got new uniforms in the rec league. Uh, this is a big deal in the small town where I'm from because I wore like my dad's rec league jersey when I was coming up. So here, Reese uh, is my brother's name and, and his friends were, were coaching them and we come to the first game and we've got brand new uniforms on. Chunk and I have gotten the appropriate coach attire. I mean, we, we are ready to redefine rec basketball in Marion County, Alabama. Now, one of our players goes into the game and it's about the second quarter. He goes down the court and comes back and he says, I, 
Is this game almost over? I said, no. You just got in the game. It's not over. We, we, got, two more. we got a whole other half to go. Oh. He goes back down. He comes back. Pristine uniform. Oh, my feet hurt. Can we end this game? No, we, we actually want to win this game. Uh, at the risk of wanting to pull this child out of the game, I had to meet a certain requirement of minutes played, and that's the only reason why this child was in the game. I, I would not throw uh, that student under the bus except to say, this is my brother Reese who is griping and complaining like this the whole time. He goes down and comes back again. My feet are barking. Can you pull me? I'm ready to get out of here. What was so interesting reflecting upon that was on the outside, he, he looks as good as he can get. I mean, new jerseys, new shorts, new shoes. He looked the part but he didn't have the heart. And what Jesus is coming at here is, be very careful, beloved, if you simply think you can look the part but not have the heart. For you think you will be great in the kingdom and you will be least. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom heaven. So I wonder today, friend, one of the most loving questions you can ask someone is, do you know Jesus Christ and are you following him? And if, as people respond in that, and I don't know maybe how you respond with that, you would, you would maybe say, I, well, Nick, I'm, I'm a member at Shades Crest. You see me every Sunday. I, we give, I give sacrificially consistently I serve in a, in a designated role in, in the church and if we're not careful beloved we will look the part but not have the heart because Jesus' work does not simply stop with the external because he's come to fulfill all righteousness he's come to do it all for us the temptation for us is to kind of hate, maybe help Jesus out by just kind of maybe not being so bad. And so we live in this world where we know we're not the worst person that we know and we're not necessarily the best person that we know. We're somewhere between, but we think we kind of know how to act. And what Jesus is getting at is something far greater and a far more significance in the kingdom. Namely, that he has come to fulfill all righteousness of the law. That he himself is the one who is the sacrificial lamb for our sake. That he himself is the one who has given his life as a ransom for many. And friend, you today, you do not have to strive to save yourself. Jesus' work is sure and good and right for you. And so we live now in light of his perfect work for us, that he has fulfilled the law, that he's fulfilled all righteousness for our sake, that we don't work for salvation, rather because of Jesus, we work from salvation, that our works then are informed and empowered by him, not so that we might save ourselves, that our righteousness is greater than that of the Pharisees if we trust in Jesus because it is Jesus' righteousness that's given to us. So friend, today I, I wonder, would you not just simply stop at looking the part? But would you allow the Lord to go deeper still and give you a brand new heart? Would you pray with me? Father, we pray today that you would Help us and teach us of Jesus, his will, his way. There's so many ways where we, we fall, we falter. 
We don't live up even to the righteousness of the Pharisees. We recognize our brokenness before you and we pray that you would have mercy on us today and that you would give us the heart that has life, that you would write your word on, your, on our hearts and that from that then we would live for your sake. These things we ask in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing and respond to God's word. you to please be seated. Before we begin our offertory and before Leslie comes and sings, his eye is on the sparrow. Uh, today is a day of prayer for the persecuted church. Churches all around the world are gathering together to pray for the persecuted church. Um, brothers and sisters that we have scattered all throughout the world who are enduring all types of suffering for Jesus' sake and their faith in him. And today we wanted to give the opportunity to pray as a church uh, and to continue in prayer even as we leave today. There, in your worship guide, you'll see three ways that we can pray um, for the persecuted church. Pray for God's presence, pray for God's provision, and pray for God's strength. And how appropriate as well that Leslie would come and sing, His Eye is on the Sparrow, that we gather in God's name today to be reminded that his eye is on those who are having to even be hidden for Jesus' sake, to have safety. That his eye is on those who are persecuted for him, uh, for his sake. And so as Leslie comes in here in just a moment and as we have our offering, uh, let me voice a prayer for us even now as we continue to worship. Would you pray with me? Father, today we pray for our brothers and sisters all around the world who are not safe because they bear Jesus Christ's name. They proclaim his name. And they gather in smaller groups. They gather secretively. They, they, they are even unable to gather because the risk of persecution is ever before them. So, Lord, we pray that your presence would be with them, that they would know that you are with them, uh, that you are looking after them and they would have a sense of that presence and it would give them hope and comfort. Father, we pray that you would provide pro exactly what they need, food, shelter, other brothers and sisters, that they would not be alone and not be lacking in what they need. And Father, we pray as well that you would give them strength and that they would be bold in their faith and that you would give them the power even to forgive those who persecute them. 
Father, as we continue to worship, we give so that your good gospel goes forth to the persecuted church, to people who don't know you and live in hostile environments for your sake. And we gather even now knowing that your eye is on the sparrow and it's on every single one of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart Thank you for being here for worship with us today and, and cons ask you to consider with us uh, what your next step might be before God. Maybe you're here for the first time and as Nick was talking about uh, God's righteousness in Jesus and how 
that's actually something that he does in our hearts, not something we're just called to do. Maybe today for the first time you felt a weight lifted off your shoulders, the weight of having to perform everything before God, and you want someone to talk with about that. Uh, we've got people at our exits who will be ready to speak with you and share the good news of Jesus with you. Uh, maybe you're here and looking for a way to plug in uh, to our church family, to join through church membership, or to follow Jesus in baptism. We've got four young men who actually took that next step through baptism last week. Uh, encourage you to see their picture in the worship guide and to just uh, congratulate and love on them. Uh, and we also had Skip Taylor join in our nine o'clock service. You'll see his picture in the spire this week, but be sure to welcome him. Uh, and, and then finally, one next step that we have uh, as we leave is to continue this week in prayer for the persecuted church. Uh, Nick led us so well in a prayer for that. Um, and, and Leslie so beautifully gave us the opportunity to think about uh, our brothers and sisters around the world right now who are worshiping Jesus just like we are and yet not in the respective privilege that we have to do so safely. Uh, and, and so we've got several ways that you can be praying for them. And to help with that, our prayer team has put together a bookmark that you can receive on the way out with seven different ways to pray. Uh, in the Spire this week, there'll be another reflection on prayer for persecuted Christians around the world. We encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity this week to pray for our brothers and our sisters who are following Jesus faithfully, even when it's hard. Uh, so would you join me now in prayer uh, as we conclude and receive this benediction and prayer for the persecuted church? Father, we thank you for the good news that Jesus has come, not just to call us into a greater righteousness, but to do that righteousness first in our hearts to call us righteous people and then show us what that looks like. We ask that you would help us to follow your spirit this week, to let him be at work in our hearts, helping us to love God and to love our neighbor. We ask that you would help us to go through our week particularly mindful of the persecuted church, those who do not have the privileges that we have here in Bluff Park to worship you freely. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would protect. We pray that you would provide, that you would strengthen our brothers and sisters who are struggling even now. Thank you for a prayer team that would even give us the opportunity to remember those around the world who follow you faithfully and need remembering and need lifting up. And more than that, we thank you, Lord, that you do not need reminding, that you remember them and that you remember us. And so we ask that you would now confirm and strengthen and establish your righteousness in our hearts through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.